Income tax 2023-2024. Business use of your home using the simplified method. Get ready and some coffee because we need to save some money for vacation with income tax preparation 2023-2024. Most of this information. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our crunching numbers is my cardio product line. Now, I'm not saying that subscribing to this channel, crunching numbers with us, will make you thin, fit, and healthy or anything. However, it does seem like it worked for her. Just saying. So... Yeah, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise so you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. She can be found in Publication 946, How to Depreciate Property, Section 179, Deduction, Special Depreciation Allowance, Makers Listed Property, and more. Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here, having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income. The sole proprietorship Schedule C rolling into line one income of the formula. Noting the Schedule C itself, basically an income statement, business income minus business expenses, which you can call business deductions, resulting in, in essence, net business income, which is what rolls in from the Schedule C to line one income of this formula. This formula outlining the Form 1040 calculation, of which we see the first page here, noting that the Schedule C ultimately rolls into line number eight. Additional income from Schedule 1. This is the Schedule 1. Additional income and adjustments to income. Part number 1. Additional income. Schedule C rolling into line 3. Business income or loss. This is the profit or loss from the Schedule C. Having an income statement format or a P&L profit and loss format. Income minus expenses. We're focused on the expenses, usually the larger of uh, the categories of items, some of those expenses being more complex than other expenses, but the general idea being they need to be ordinary and necessary for the generation of the income. All right, so now we're looking at the business use of the home, which we started discussing in prior presentations, the general idea from an accounting and bookkeeping as well as tax standpoint is that we typically want to keep our personal bookkeeping separate from the business bookkeeping. And if we can do that, it should make the data input into the tax return quite easy because the Schedule C is basically an income statement for our business activities. But some things are difficult to break out between personal and business, such as the home. If you use part of the home, for business because many of the bills that you have for the home are going to cover the entire home where you only have a portion of it that's going to be allocated to your business office. So if we have a business office, as we discussed in the past, we need to determine if it qualifies as a deductible home office. And if it does, then we have to find some way to be breaking out between the personal and the business. You can link this to something similar to what we saw with the car in prior courses or sections when we saw that the automobile often also has a personal and business component to it. And the IRS often gives us a simplified method to deal with the automobile, that being the mileage method, as opposed to taking the actual uh, expense method. So you can choose which method to some degree, at least with certain limitations, that you're going to use no matter which one you choose you will recall it's going to mess up our bookkeeping though because on the bookkeeping side of things we're tracking things based on the cash flow and so no matter what we do if we switch from using a cash flow basis to record our expenses 
to the mileage method for an automobile, then we on the tax side are going to have to make an adjustment to the income statement, even if the bookkeeping was done perfectly. Similarly, with the home office, we can choose to use the actual method to write off or we can use a simplified method. No matter which one we choose, it's going to kind of mess up the bookkeeping and we're going to have to do a tax adjusting entry in essence uh, for it. Now, the simplified method is, of course, designed to be simplified, similar to the mileage method, but it's going to be something that I don't think is as effective as the mileage method across the entire country because of the wide disparity in cost of living throughout the country. This is the problem of having a federal laws that are in place over the entire country. Oftentimes, it doesn't make sense because the cost of living in part of the country is quite different, especially when you're talking about housing. So that means that the simplified methods you would think is not going to be very impactful. It's not the one you're probably going to pick if you're in a high cost of living area, California, New York, or something like that. But if you're in a low cost of living area, maybe it will actually be higher than what you would actually get if you if you calculated the actual amount because you would think the simplified method would be somewhere in the average uh, uh of the country okay so your deduction for the qualified business use of a home is the sum of each amount you figure for a separate qualified business use of your home to figure your deduction for the business use of a home using the simplified method you will need to know the following information for each qualified business use of the home so the allowable area of your home used in conducting the business so note when we use the actual method we kind of thought that hey what we need to do is get the square footage of the room compared to the total square footage of the place and that gives us a ratio analysis. You might think, well, the simplified method should be easier. I shouldn't have to do that. But still, you would think, how are they going to do the simplified method? They're going to base it on possibly like the square, the size of the room, right? And if that's the case, then you're still going to have to figure that out, which is often the missing piece to do to do the actual method, right? So, so you still have to figure that piece out. Now, the actual method, the other thing that complicates the actual method uh, would be depreciation. So the simplified method might be a way to kind of get away from that depreciation calculation if you own the home. If you rent the home and you don't have to deal with depreciation, then you don't have that complexity either. Just a couple things to consider when choosing the methods here. So if you did not conduct the business for the entire year in the home or the area changed during the year you will need to know the allowable area you used and the number of days you conducted the business for each month so typically it would be a whole year but if not then you're going to have to do that partial year component so the gross income from the business use of your home so typically it would be the gross income of the business you would think but again uh, you could have situations where you have the gross income from other places as well. So the amount of the business expenses that are not related to the use of your home. And uh, if the qualified business use is for a daycare facility, that once again is kind of like the exceptions to the general rule that use space in your home on a regular but not exclusive basis, uh, you will need to know the percentage of time that part of your home is used for daycare. So daycare becomes a bit of a complication because you have that crossover between using it for business and personal. Okay, once we have the ingredients, how do we put the recipe together? So to figure the amount uh, you can deduct for qualified business use of, of your home using the simplified method, follow these three steps. So here's the instructions. Here's the recipe. Multiply the allowable area by $5 uh, or less than $5 if the qualified business use is for a daycare that uses space in your home on a regular but not exclusive basis. That's kind of the exception to the rule. Once again, that daycare thing. Uh, see allowable area and space used regularly for daycare later. Subtract the expenses from the business that are not related to the use of the home from the gross income related to the business of the home. Uh, if these expenses are greater than the gross income from the business use of the home, then you cannot take a deduction for this business use of the home. So in other words, why do we have this calculation here? Because as we saw in the past, when you have a loss, 
the IRS is going to be skeptical of losses and possibly not allow uh, losses in some cases. So that's what we're seeing uh, here. We're going to be limited basically to the business having income. If you have income, you could take you could typically take the home office deduction against it. If it's going to put you into the category of a loss, that's where some limitations are could apply. So take uh, the smaller of the amounts from one and two. This is the amount you can deduct for this qualified business use of your home using the simplified method. So if you are a partner or you use your home in your farming business and file schedule F, so we're kind of focused on the schedule C, remember that farming uh, has a lot of its own kind of special rules due to the nature of farming and so on. So if you're a tax preparer, make sure that you're either prepared to do the research uh, if you're not familiar with farming or that's a good area to specialize if you can pick up uh, clients in that area so because other people might not know it as well. So you can use the simplified method worksheet near the end of this publication to help you figure your deduction. So if you use your home in a trade or business and you file a Schedule C Form 1040, you will use the simplified method worksheet in your instructions for Schedule C to figure your deduction. Allowable area. In most cases, the allowable area is the smaller of the actual area in square feet. So once again, we're going to have to get out the trusty ruler if we don't know the area of the actual office and map it out. So length times width, you know, of your home used in uh, conducting the business and 300 square feet. So it's limited to that 300. So if we're trying to choose whether to use the simplified method or the actual method, you would think if the place that we're using, the home office, is greater, larger than 300 square feet, it's quite likely that using the actual method might give us a higher deduction than the simplified method, which limits the size to 300 square feet. So your allowable area may be smaller if you conduct the business as a qualified joint venture with your spouse, the area used by the business was shared with another qualified business use. You use the home for the business for only part of the year or the area used by the business changed during the year. So you can use the area adjustment worksheet for a simplified method near the end of this publication to help you figure your allowable area for a qualified business use. Area used by a qualified joint venture. So if the qualified business use of the home is also a uh, qualified joint venture, you and your spouse will figure the deduction for the business use separately. So this gets into the idea of if I have a Schedule C type of business, if I'm married, then you would think that the married couple has joined spiritually and for tax purposes as one entity, right? You're going to tax it as one entity. But we see that sometimes uh, the, there's reasons that the tax code still treats the two individuals as separate, such as for social security payments and so on, because they're going to be paid into the social security by separate social security numbers, which becomes an issue. So that also leads to a problem that if the spouses own a sole proprietorship business together, you would think they would own it as one entity because they're one taxable unit, one taxable entity. But again, often mainly possibly because of that social security issue, uh, and that's going to be calculated on the self-employment uh, taxes, then you, there's a problem doing that because then the question is, well, who's going to be allocated the social security and so on to whose number? So usually when two people have the business, if they weren't married, you'd have to file a partnership return. So even if they are married, you could theoretically file a partnership return and have the two partners, which are a married couple, the partnership flows into the individual tax return. And then you'd have the two 1040s that would then allocate out the income, which would then allow you to, to break out the social security. Or if you're a community property state, then you might be able to 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 treat it differently as basically like your one entity and break it out evenly between the two or you might have a joint venture kind of situation so that so we've talked about that in a prior course or section 
But then, of course, that can have implications on other parts of your Schedule C, such as the home office. All right. Split the actual use uh, using the conducting business between you and your spouse in the same manner you split other tax attributes. So in other words, if you're splitting it like evenly, it would be a 50-50 split. But then, of course, you would think that you would split it in accordance with the same kind of ratio that you're splitting the business up, all the line items up between uh, the two if it's something other than that as well. So then each spouse will figure the allowable area separately. For more information about qualified joint venture, you can see qualified joint venture and the instructions for Schedule C. I think we've talked about that before. So you can take a look at prior course or section on that. It's a great topic. Shared use. So if you share your home with someone else you, uh, who uses the home to conduct business that also qualifies for this deduction, you may not include the same square feet to figure your deduction as the other person. You must, al you can't, that'd be like double dipping, right? That'd be kind of like double dip. So you must allocate the shared space between you and the other person in some reasonable manner. Example, Lindsay and Tracy are roommates. Lindsay uses 300 square feet of their home for qualified business use. Tracy uses 200 square feet of their home for a separate qualified business use. Lindsay and Tracy both share 100 square feet for their respective qualified business in their mutual home. In addition to the portion that they do not share, Lindsay and Tracy can both claim 50 of the 100 square feet or divide the 100 uh, square feet between them in any reasonable manner. If divided evenly, Lindsay could claim 250 square feet using the simplified method and Tracy could claim 150 square feet. More than one qualified business use. So if you conduct more than one business qualifying for the deduction, you are limited to a maximum of 300 square feet for all of the businesses. So similarly here, multiple businesses possibly have multiple Schedule C's uh, that, you're, that you are working with, you still have that 300 uh, limit, 300 square feet for the simplified method. Allocate the actual square footage used up to the maximum 300 square feet among your qualified business uses in a reasonable manner. In other words, you might say, hey, look, if I have two Schedule C businesses, then I should get 600 square feet, right? Because I can allocate between the two of them. But no, they're saying simplified method limited to 300 square feet, which you would then need to allocate between the two Schedule Cs. However, do not allocate more square feet to a qualified business use than you actually use for that business. Rental use. So the simplified method does not apply to rental use. So notice, and that kind of is okay generally because you would think the rental use would be easier in and of itself. Because remember, when we're choosing between the simplified method and the actual uh, method, you could either be renting your home or you could be owning the home. When you own the home, the complication that really often comes up is the whole issue with the basis of the home and depreciating the home, which could impact, again, the, the basis upon sales price of the home. Uh, and so that gets a little bit messy. So that might be one reason that you would want to possibly use a simplified method in that case. It also gets quite confusing to be allocating between Schedule A and Schedule C for things like mortgage interest and real estate taxes, which you're already getting a deduction for on Schedule A, but now you have to allocate between Schedule A and Schedule C. So that might be the easier thing to do. But again, the problem with the simplified method is that for many people, like where I'm at, I don't think it's I don't, I haven't seen a situation where it's going to come out to be beneficial, <laughs> like a higher deduction. So it depends where you kind of live. But so anyways, the simplified method does not apply to rental use. A rental use that qualifies for the deduction must be figured using actual expenses. If the rental use and qualified business use share the same area, you will have to allocate the actual area used between the two uses. You cannot use the same area to figure a deduction for the qualified business use uh, as, you, as you are using to figure the deduction for the rental use. Part uh, year use or area changes for simplified method only. 
So if you qualified business uh, use was for a portion of the year, so you've only been using that home office for the portion of the year, for example, a seasonal business, a business that begins during the year, or you moved during the year, or you changed the square footage of your qualified business use, your deduction is limited to the average monthly allowable square footage. So you calculate the average monthly allowable square footage by adding the amount of, of allowable square feet you used in uh, each month and dividing the sum by 12. So remember you have a total of that 300, but now we're gonna basically say, okay, now we're gonna have an average. So we're gonna have to figure out the average number of square feet that we used during any of the 12 months and then divide it by 12. That's gonna give us the average. So obviously, if we didn't use part of the home and we only used it for seven months, then you know the months that we didn't use it would be zero and then the full amount of the square foots for the rest of the month that would average over the 12 months. So when determining the average monthly allowable square footage, you cannot take more than 300 square feet into account for any one month. So we're limited to 300. So, so, you, might be, so you might say, well, is that 300 the limitation on the total that I cannot go over. Yes, there is that limitation, but you might say, well, then I had, I had a home office that had 400 square feet, but when I average it out against the fact that I didn't use it for part of the year, the average comes out to something under 300. Well, that's still the IRS is saying, well, no, you can't do that because now you still, you still are saying that you used your, you calculating the average with a square footage over 300 even though the result comes out to something under 300, you can't use something over the 300 to calculate the average for crying out loud. And anyways, additionally, if your qualified business use was less than 15 days in a month, you must use zero for that month. All right, let's look at an example. Jay files their federal income tax return on a calendar year basis. On July 20th, Jay began using 420 square feet. Oh, it's over the 300 feet at their home for a qualified business use. Jay continues to, do, to use 420 square feet of their home until the end of the year. The average monthly allowable square feet is 125 square feet, which is figured using 300 square feet for each month August through December divided by the number of months in the year. So again, this is what we're saying. So you might have said, hey, why doesn't he use, if he used the same calculation with 400, 420, 420, 420, 420 420 divided by 12, then he might still come out to a result that is under the cap of 300. And therefore you would think it'd be reasonable, but no, because the IRS is saying, but no, you can't, you can't go over that 300 even when doing the partial year calculation. That's what we're saying here. Okay, example two. Jesse files their federal tax return on a calendar year basis. On April 20th, Jesse began using 100 square feet of their home for a qualified business use. On August 5th, Jesse expanded the area of qualified use to 330 square feet. So the office got bigger. Jesse continued to use the 330 square feet until the end of the year. The average monthly allowable square footage is 150 square feet, which is figured using 100 square feet for May through July and 300 square feet for August through December divided by the number of months in the year. So now he didn't have any office in the beginning. That's where the zeros come from. Then he had a little office. He was working in the closet for three months and then he made it large a big improvement on square footage but it went over the 300 limitation and therefore we're capped at the 300 and then we take that divided by 12 giving us the average monthly square feet let's look at another example uh Guadalupe, Guadalupe files uh, their income tax return as a calendar year basis from January 1st to July uh, 16th Guadalupe I uh, used 300 square feet of their home for a qualified business use. On July 17th, Guadalupe moved to a new home and immediately began using 200 square feet for the same qualified business use. 
While preparing their tax return, Guadalupe decided to use the simplified method to determine the qualified business use of the first home and files a form 8829 to deduct the qualified business use of the second home. So the average monthly allowable square footage is 175 square feet, which is using 300 square feet for July through, uh, through January through July, divided by the number of months in the year 300, 300, 300, and so on, divided by 12. All right, gross income limitation. So there's only much, so much gross stuff you can, you can take, and there's, the IRS has a gross income limitation because they were over grossified so here we go so that doesn't make any sense sorry about that so your deduction for the business use of home is limited to the amount equal to the gross income derived from the qualified business use of the home reduced by the business deductions that are unrelated to the use of your home so in other words we're trying to figure out if it's going to result in a loss or not because remember if it results in a loss the IRS is skeptical of allowing you to take losses because then you might be able to take the loss against other income like W-2 income and the IRS is your silent partner when you make money. That's when they want their peace. When you lose money, that's when they're, they're silent and they say, we're not, you know, you can't do that. We're not, we're not part of that. We're not part of your loserness times. We're only part of the good times when we're getting paid out here. Anyways. So if the business deductions uh, that are unrelated to the use of your home are greater than the gross income derived from the qualified business use of your home, then you cannot take a deduction for this qualified business use of your home. Business expenses not related to use of the home. What are those? These expenses relate to the business activity in the home, but not to the use of the home itself. You can still deduct business expenses that are unrelated to the use of the home. So see where to deduct later. Examples of business expenses that are not related to the use of the home are advertising, wages, supplies, dues, and depreciation for equipment, the standard kind of deductions. So space used regularly for daycare. Here's that exception situation, the whole daycare thing. So those kids running around, you can't keep them into a controlled space. They have to be in the living room, which is part of the normal living space and whatnot. And so you can't separate the business from the personal, but you still want a deduction for the daycare because someone has to take care of those crazy kids and you need, you need a tax code to help incentivize that or something. I don't know. So if you do not use the area... Uh, of your home exclusively for daycare, you must reduce the prescribed rate, maximum $5 per square foot, before figuring your deduction. The reduced rate will equal the prescribed uh, rate times a fraction. The number of the fraction is the number of hours that the space was used during the year for daycare, and the denominator is the total number of hours during the year that the space was available for all uses. So now we don't have a business use of the property. It's both personal and business. So we're trying to come up with some fraction now in a similar way as we tried to come up with a fraction of the home by using square footage compared to the total square footage. This time we're trying to figure out the number of hours we spent with those crazy kids tearing our home apart for the daycare versus the, the, the total number of hours that we were living in the home when it was torn apart, but they weren't actively tearing it apart uh, at that time, a ratio calculation. So you can use the daycare facility worksheet for simplified method near the end of this publication to help you figure the reduced rate tip. So if you used at least 300 square feet for daycare regularly and exclusively during the year, then you do not need to reduce the, pre the prescribed rate or complete the daycare facility worksheet.